Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah will be anchoring top story later on today. Right now on Morning News Now, Walmart shooting. Breaking overnight, several people are dead after a gunman opened fire in a Virginia Walmart just two days before Thanksgiving. We're on the scene with the latest on the investigation and what happened. Terrifying night. The Virginia shooting comes just days after the mass shooting at an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado. The suspect in that attack now scheduled to face a judge today. This morning we're hearing from more survivors, including a man shot seven times. I got hit seven times in the back uh, with bullets. I got clipped a few more times after that, actually. Saturday night, I thought I was dead. The latest on the investigation in that case and what we are now learning about the victims. Also this morning on the move. Today is one of the busiest travel days of the year and it's putting airlines and airports to the test. We're going to tell you how the military is being called in to make sure you get to your Thanksgiving table on time. Plus, World Cup fever. The U.S. is not known as a big soccer uh, country, but this week it is different. We're going to show you how people across the country are getting swept up in the game as Team USA keeps its hopes alive in the World Cup. We're going to begin this morning with that breaking news out of Chesapeake, Virginia, and a mass shooting at a Walmart there overnight. Police say at least seven people are confirmed dead, including the suspected shooter. A senior law enforcement official tells NBC News that the shooter was a disgruntled employee. FBI agents were on the scene last night, and the ATF has said that it would also assist in the investigation. In a statement, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin said, Our hearts break with the community of Chesapeake this morning. I remain in contact with law enforcement enforcement officials throughout this morning and have made available any resources as this investigation moves forward. Heinous acts of violence have no place in our communities. We have full team coverage this morning, starting with NBC News correspondent Cal Perry on the scene in Chesapeake. Joe, in the hours that immediately followed the shooting, the priority for authorities was to clear the Walmart behind me to find anybody who may have been hiding in there, sheltering in place. Now that they have done that and the site is secure, they are turning their attention to the broader investigation. Most importantly, of course, who the shooter was and what the possible motive is. At least seven people dead at this hour, including that shooter. Police in their initial press conference say they don't believe that they fired any shots. There are, in addition, at least five people wounded in an Area 1 trauma center. We understand in a nearby hospital, those five people will be key to any investigation, also including any interviews of eyewitnesses. You can see how large the parking lot is behind me. It is, of course, the season where everybody is shopping. The store, we understand, was quite full when the shooting began. Joe? All right, Cal Perry, thank you so much. Let's bring in Catherine Schweit. Now, she is the author of Stop the Killing, How to End the Mass Shooting Crisis. She's also a retired FBI agent executive who created and ran the FBI's active shooter program. We're, we're grateful to have you with us this morning. I mean, unfortunately, we are dealing with the aftermath of yet another mass shooting. This one comes two nights before Thanksgiving, three nights after what we've been experiencing in Colorado Springs. What's your reaction to what we're learning, especially as NBC News learns from a senior law enforcement official that the shooter was a disgruntled employee. Yeah, I think it's a couple of things that come to mind right away, Joe. One is that uh, this is the season of stress. And what we know for sure is that individuals have several stresses that happen to them and something triggers. So I think we're going to find out in an employee situation that something triggered that person. That's the workplace violence that we all learn about. And, and this is the ultimate time when people are so stressed out. You know, I have, uh, my daughter has a business, a music store right there in Chesapeake and uh, her boyfriend works literally next door to that. I think it's a message, message to America that this can happen anywhere and does happen anywhere. You need to be prepared. You need to know how to protect yourself. You need to run, hide, fight. You need to, if you don't know how to do it, go on my website. There's a FBI video right there, katherineschweit.com. But it's a terrible situation that we're dealing with and it's not gonna go away in part because these shootings are kind of a contagion thing. And when one shooting happens, then somebody else who's thinking about it thinks, I can do that. And it's frightening to say that, but that's exactly what happens. Which begs the question, I guess, what do we do to solve this? And that's a debate that just continues to happen. I do want to ask you right now really about the investigation. We know that the suspected gunman is dead. So what does that mean for law enforcement? What is their focus right now? What's their priority? 
You know, and these kinds of investigations, what we do is, you know, we work backwards. The FBI is there because they're there in support, just like ATF is there in support. The local police will be responsible for the investigation. And what they'll do is work backwards, interview everybody on the scene. FBI, for instance, comes in oftentimes to collect evidence, in, especially in a complicated shooting scene, because they have a lot of team members and a lot of uh, equipment that can do that, especially for a smaller department, and uh, which most police departments are, right? And so they'll they'll collect the evidence, they'll do interviews of everybody that's in the hospital, out of the hospital, next door, people who are working next door, um, people who are in the parking lot, as they, I understand there was a person killed outside. And then they'll work backwards in that subject's history and find out what warning signs might have been there that people might have seen, what behaviors of concern might people have seen that led him on this pathway to violence. Because although we want to believe, because it seems most sensible, that maybe a, one of these kinds of shooters snaps, they don't snap. They plan this and they prepare it and they are stressed out and they have these actions that occur that others see. And think about the fact that he came in with a gun to his place of employment, if in fact that's the effects uh, bear out what you, you're mentioning. This guy planned this ahead of time and people saw his actions, saw his mood, saw his, his weapon use, things like that. Those are the signs that we need people to report. It's, it go, comes right back to see something, say something, see something, say something. But right now the police are just working back in his history to piece together what happened. Catherine, I'm struck by a headline that surfaced this week. For the third straight year, there have been more than 600 multiple victim shootings in America. That's according to the Gun Violence Archive. You mentioned right. the copycat nature of this, but also it's just a problem we have here in America. What do you think are the top priorities that need to, need to be focused on to try and prevent these from happening, to get those numbers moving in another direction? Yeah, I know the team that worked the gun violence um, project and, you know, they're, you know, they're trying to put the data out there so that researchers can do their work. But when it comes to plain old Americans and what we should be doing, one of the things that struck me most in, uh, in the research that's come out of the FBI in the last few years is that where um, law enforcement might have a, a 25 percent uh, chance of catching information on this type of a shooter, uh, friends family, schoolmates, um, spouses, they are the ones that have a 70% or more chance of knowing school, in, in the case of schoolmates, 90%. So people know ahead of time, the shooters leak their, their, their distrust, their disdain, their anger, their intent to do something. They, they say things and they do things. And America really has to engage in, in looking at the people around them. Get your faces up from your phones or your computers. And when you think that somebody says, he isn't a threat, because which is what we all say in our family, he's never done anything like that before. Well, that's every single shooter. They've never done anything like that before. So you can't use that as an excuse to not report them, not to reach out to them. And, and let me tell you one other thing, Joe. Yeah. 30 to 40% of these guys, uh, these individuals, um, intend to and do commit suicide. It's the same things. So we're talking about saving the lives of the people around you who you love. Catherine Schweit, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your expertise as we try to digest yet another one of these mass shootings this morning. Thanks, Joe. Now, we are learning new details about the suspected shooter linked to the Colorado Springs attack. That includes previous charges that were dropped by the state. The El pa Paso County Sheriff's Office says the suspect was charged with menacing and kidnapping in 2021, but prosecutors did not go through with the case, and the record was later sealed by a judge. Now, details about the shooter's background have led to new renewed criticism over the effectiveness of red flag laws in Colorado. NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett joins us from Colorado Springs with more on this. So, Maura, we have new details about the background of the suspected shooter. What have officials learned about these previous charges in 2021 and about the suspect's family upbringing? Well, in terms of those charges, there's been a lot of speculation, a lot of confusion about why officials can't really speak to that matter. Now, in Colorado, uh, even though we do know that he, the, the suspect was connected to uh, this bomb threat back in 2021, basically Colorado law, if a case is then dismissed from uh, court for any reason, it is then sealed because it's supposed to protect the suspect from uh, being judged or, or being any, anything being held against them going forward. And officials then have to 
say that there is no record of it. Because there's no record of it, that could be what didn't trigger those red flag laws, which then could have enabled the suspect to legally purchase the weapons that were used in this shooting. Now, in terms of other background information, we have learned that the suspect had changed to their name uh, when they were a teenager, and we have learned that this is because uh, it was out of fear due to criminal violations from the suspect's father, domestic violence uh, charges against the suspect's mother. We know that the suspect lived with their grandparents uh, prior to the shooting. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, confusion about some of the background and any planning that has gone into uh, what the investigation is looking at. We also learned overnight that officials have spoken with one of the recent neighbors of the suspect who said that the suspect had made um, anti-LGBTQ comments in the past. The neighbor, Xavier Krause, had said uh, he is not somebody that I would bring around uh, my gay friends because of the hate uh, he, the, the suspect had expressed in the past. And so we are anticipating learning more, especially as the suspect is interviewed by police. Yeah, no, we also could learn more today when the suspected shooter is set to appear virtually in court. I mean, what can we expect during that hearing? Well, this will be the first time that we see the suspect or any video or photos of the suspect. We haven't gotten a booking photo yet. Uh, when he, the, the suspect was released from the hospital yesterday, uh, they, their injuries had uh, recovered enough that they were able to be turned over to police uh, custody. And basically at this virtual hearing, we expect to see some charges brought forward. Uh, the, the DA officials have said that they intend to bring five counts of murder, an additional five counts of bias, motivated crimes. Those are hate crimes uh, as they're charged here in Colorado. We also intend Anticipate potentially even more charges. The district attorney reminded us that those five murder charges do carry a life sentence without the option for parole, but they do think it's important if there is evidence towards a hate crime that they prosecute it because they want to make sure everyone in the community and nationally know that they do not tolerate hate crimes like that. All right, Maura Barrett, thank you so much. And we're going to be following both this story in Colorado as well as the shooting in Virginia this morning and throughout the day. We'll bring you the latest developments as we get them. Big crowds are on the road and in the skies this morning, less than 24 hours until the Thanksgiving holiday. Airlines are stepping up their efforts to handle the surge of travelers after months of disruptions and delays. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has the very latest for us. Yeah, good morning. So drop off is already underway uh, at the curb here in Washington and at airports nationwide. I love this airport. I want to show you what, it's, what it looks like inside right now. As soon as you come through the doors here at Reagan Airport, you immediately get to see what's happening out there on the runways, for example, out on the tarmacs with American Airlines planes already moving away from their gate, ready to take off as sun comes up here in Washington. Come over here to the status board because this is good news, not just at this airport, but nationwide. Take a look at this. On time, on time, on time, on time, on time. That's not just Washington. This is really what's happening nationwide. At this moment, this morning, we've only got 24 flight cancellations nationwide. It's been six months since the Memorial Day weekend kicked off weeks of summertime travel chaos. Fast forward to Thanksgiving and what a difference. Two million plus flyers each day this week, with FlightAware reporting fewer than 60 flights canceled so far and only 15% of flights delayed. I think they're anticipating the crowd and they're just keeping it going nicely. After going on a massive hiring binge, the airlines say they now have the most employees on record, though they still need more pilots. They've also trimmed their schedules to avoid a repeat of the summer mess. The FAA says it's also increased air traffic control staffing, though blue sky flying conditions have made a big difference this week. A cautious transportation secretary on CNBC this morning. I think we're still many months away from getting to a level where we're all confident that the system could fully absorb a major weather event. But most Americans are driving this week with gas prices well below the $5 mark last June. Shannon and Justin Foran just spent 22 hours on the road with their two kids from Tamworth, New Hampshire to Hudson, Florida, stopping in Hershey Park, PA along the way. It was probably about half of what it would have cost for two of us to fly. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the National Safety Council warns this could be the deadliest Thanksgiving since 2007, with a potential for nearly 520 traffic fatalities. The reminder before we all head out, stay safe on the roads and in the sky. Back here at the airports, these airlines are flying so full right now. Airports are so full. A lot of airports are running out of the reserved parking spots, including SeaTac 
and Washington Dulles and LAX, for example, Atlanta, Midway, O'Hare. So if you are going to be trying to park, you may still find a spot, but the reserve spots may very well already be taken. Back to you. All right, Tom Costello, thank you so much. And of course, millions of Americans are choosing to drive to their Thanksgiving destinations. NBC News senior national correspondent Kerry Sanders has the latest on how traffic is moving this morning. Well, when you hit the roads today, there's a good bet that, uh, well, it may look like this, which is nice and clean sailing here on I-95 South in Pennsylvania, or it may not be so pretty. And that's because starting at around 11 o'clock till 8 o'clock today, you're going to see a lot of traffic. That's the really peak time that people are on the road, so expect that. And then tomorrow, again at around 11, and it'll go up to around 3 o'clock, which makes sense because most people begin sitting down at the table at around 3, 4 o'clock, so just keep all of that in mind. Now, as you're driving and you're hopefully seeing some clean roads like this, you're taking your time, no need to race, uh, there are some tips of what you might want to be able to use as you're driving down the road. So you could use the very familiar app called Waze. And we know that the Waze app tells you kind of what the traffic is ahead of you, whether there's something ahead. But there's also another app, and I got this tip from a trucker. It's called iExit. And iExit will tell you what's coming up at each exit. Not only a place maybe to get some gas, but if somebody's in the back seat saying, I gotta pull over, you know what's ahead there. And you can go, okay, we're 1.3 miles away. Everything's gonna be okay. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, Kerry Sanders on the road. Thank you so much. Let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather, Michelle Grossman's here. We heard Tom Costello say at the airport, on time, on time, on time, on time. No big surprise, right? The weather's looking good. Weather's looking good. It's going to look all well today. And then tomorrow, things are going to change a bit. Okay. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So we're going to enjoy today first because when you look at this map, you see a lot of sunshine. We have high pressure and control for a lot of us. That means sunshine. Temperatures are starting to moderate, so it feels good as well. We're looking at a cold front moving through the Rockies. That's going to bring some snow. Also looking at an area of low pressure that's going to bring a little bit of shower activity today into Texas. That's really going to expand tomorrow. A stationary front bringing a few showers into portions of central and southern Florida. Could see some heavy rain, some downpours at times. Otherwise, we're looking really, really good as we head throughout today. Tomorrow looking good, too, for the Macy's Day Thanksgiving Day Parade. Sunny skies, 9 a.m., 42 degrees by noon. Lots of sunshine, too. 49 light winds. That's a big thing. That's going to uh, be good for the balloons to fly. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to be headed to the parade, just bring the sunglasses. Also bring maybe a layer or two. We're looking at temperatures in the lower 40s, upper 40s by the end of the parade. And that isn't bad for November, late November. Otherwise, today we are looking at a few showers over Florida and South Texas. Just nuisance storms, not big storms. And then a cold front bring, bringing through, uh, swinging through the Rockies, bringing some snow. Notice what happens tomorrow on Thanksgiving. A lot of us are traveling on the roadways. We're going to see that rain expand into Oklahoma, Arkansas, also Louisiana into Mississippi, and you could see it's heavy with those brighter colors, the reds, the yellows, the oranges. That's indicating that we could see some heavy rain. We could see some locally flash uh, floods as we head throughout your Thanksgiving day. That's going to continue on Friday. So that area of low pressure uh, still affecting portions of Texas where we see some western snow in the, the western parts of Texas, some heavy rain throughout Texas. And then we're going to see the Gulf Coast getting in on some rain as well. Could see some stronger storms tomorrow as well. Winds gusting 60 miles per hour, an isolated tornado or two. Um, and, of course, that heavy rain. So the bullseye for the heavy rain into portions of Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and also Texas. Here's a look at that snowfall forecast down the Rockies where you see those pinks and purples and blues. Blues. That's where we're expecting the highest amount of snowfall totals from anywhere from four or six, even up to eight inches. But we're milder. We've been so cold, Joe, for so long, yeah. right? And we're going to start to moderate today. We're looking at 53. That's above average for this time of year in New York City. It's a round average, which we, we never talk about average anymore. Yeah, it's yeah, always that's like, so it's true. like it's 75 it's or it's like 25. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you so much, Michelle. Sure. Happy Thanksgiving to you. You too. All right. In other news now, the Biden administration is once again extending a pause on federal student loan payments. This comes as President Biden's student loan forgiveness program faces several legal challenges. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba joins us now with more. So, Monica, I'm going to be blunt here. This is getting confusing. So walk us through this latest update on student loan forgiveness. I mean, what what is it borrowers who are trying to get some of this forgiven need to know right now? 
It's complex and there's a lot of layers to it, Joe. You're absolutely right. The first and most important thing here is that the Biden administration rolled out this student debt forgiveness plan a couple of months ago. Millions signed up for it, but it is right now in legal limbo while the Supreme Court weighs whether it can proceed. And that is why the education secretary is saying these payments that were set to resume in January now won't resume until at least June, depending on what happens in the court. So the president was the one to make this announcement yesterday. And and he really put it in some blunt terms, saying that this was unfair to these millions of borrowers who are in financial limbo trying to figure out when they're going to have to pay next and what they may have to pay. Take a listen to a little bit of that. It isn't fair to ask tens of millions of borrowers eligible for relief to resume their student debt payments while the courts consider the lawsuit. For that reason, the Secretary of Education is extending the pause on student loan payments while we seek relief from the courts. This is the eighth time that that pause has been put in place and extended, Joe. Of course, this went into effect originally because of the COVID pandemic. That's when this started back in 2020. But then the fact that candidate Joe Biden wanted to implement this thing he promised to do, they thought was going to be kind of the end to this. People could start to put together their plan up to $10,000 for some people, up to $20,000 in forgiveness for those receiving Pell Grants. So you can imagine a lot of Americans coming up on the holidays, trying to budget, trying to financially plan, simply don't know in terms of when this is going to be resolved by the Supreme Court. We have some expectation that the states who had blocked this, some of which are Republican-led, and that is what ultimately went all the way up to the Supreme Court from the federal level, they have until today by noon to file their response to the Supreme Court. So we could have a development in the next couple of weeks, but either way, the Biden administration does say they believe this plan is legal, they plan to defend it, but they also know that this could take months. So instead of having people really wringing their hands, worried about a January deadline, they pushed it to June, but we could be back in the same place just a couple of months from now, Joe. Monica, I do want to ask you a little more about the Supreme Court part of this. We know it was last week the Biden administration asked SCOTUS to get involved. So what should we know about that? How, how could this pause then impact that request? Exactly. So this is the defense of the Biden administration and the U.S. government. The education secretary actually wrote in that saying that you shouldn't penalize these more than 40 million Americans who would be eligible for this plan just because some states are saying that this could be unfair to people who actually don't want the debt forgiveness because it could increase their taxes. That is one of the arguments in one of the states, for instance. So instead, the president and his top aides really have doubled, tripled, quadrupled down and said, we do believe in this. Of course, they studied the legality of this before putting it into motion. They did expect some battles, but they didn't believe it would take this long. And now, again, we're talking June 2023 before we may know when the payments will resume or what will happen to them. Millions of folks waiting for an answer here. Monica, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up on Morning News Now, more people are gathering this Thanksgiving than we've seen in the past few years. But with COVID, flu, and now RSV spreading, how do you avoid getting sick at the airport or at the dinner table? Just ahead, we've got some ways to keep you and your family as healthy as possible this season. Welcome back. As millions of Americans plan to hit the road this holiday, doctors are warning about a triple-demic, three respiratory illnesses that are spreading across the country and could get worse this holiday season. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the very latest. This morning, as families prepare to gather for Thanksgiving, public health officials are intensifying their warnings of a triple-demic. What's unique about this year is that we are seeing a more virulent type of the flu. We don't know. This is a unique situation where we have COVID, RSV, and the flu circulating and making, making folks sick. Two children's hospitals in Oregon now declaring they are in crisis standards of care because of mounting cases of RSV. In Riverside County, California, a young child has died, possibly linked to the respiratory virus. In Kansas City, Missouri, Children's Mercy Hospital reported more than 1,000 flu cases last week, an unusual spike. And in Kentucky, 30 school districts have had to close at least one school this month because too many students were sick. Bye, Ella. Can you in New York, the parents of Ella Rose Guillaume are happy she's home after a week in the hospital. It was terrifying. Um, it was surreal. I'm like, I've seen your daughter on a breeding mask and she's only three and a half. 
We recently visited Mass General for Children in Boston, which was postponing some elective pediatric medical procedures to free up space. Dr. Anthony Fauci, in his final White House briefing before retiring, urging Americans to still be cautious about COVID this holiday season. You might want to get a test that day before you come into a place in which you might be infected and spread it. Health officials now recommending several steps to stop the spread of respiratory illnesses. Wash your hands, stay home if you're sick, improve your air by opening windows, and make sure your COVID and flu vaccines are up to date. The CDC saying new data shows the Omicron boosters are better at preventing symptomatic COVID infection than earlier doses. We're doing everything we can in the next six weeks to help families get their updated COVID shots by the end of the year because it's the best protection for this winter. And something else that's taking a toll on many hospitals this winter, staffing shortages. More than half a million people in the healthcare and social services industries quit their positions in September, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Many of them citing burnout, Joe. No surprise there. All right, Gabe, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's continue the conversation with Dr. John Torres. More advice on how you can stay safe while you're traveling and visiting your family. Dr. Torres, good to have you with us. I mean, so we just heard Dr. Fauci say he recommended people get tested before gathering. What does that mean? Is he just talking about COVID tests? Are there other tests you can take before getting together? And Joe, the main one he's talking about is the COVID test, because that's the at-home test that we have. The flu test, you'd have to go to a clinic to get that. But what he's actually talking about, if you, if you saw the whole sound bite he had there, he's talking about the spectrum of protection, as he describes it. And that means you know, masking, social distancing, testing, you know, staying home if you're sick, opening windows, all those different things we know about. And the more you do, the more protection you're going to get for you and those around you, the loved ones. And so it's going to depend on where you're going, who you're going to be there with. But testing is definitely something I I would consider going the day of, especially if there are more vulnerable people, the young and the very old. But by far, with the things Gabe talked about there, the one thing I would mention that is most important, I think, at this point, is to make sure that you stay home if you are sick. But the other thing to realize, too, is if you do these at-home tests that we have here, and I have a few here still left from before, look at the expiration dates. And if it is expired, go to the FDA site because they extended those expirations. And this one expired in July, but it's extended till December, so it's still good to use. So again, look into that, Joe, because that could be something that could come in handy, but definitely something to think about. Good reminder. Some of those tests have been maybe gathering dust over the last few months. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> I guess for those who are traveling, I want to know what are some of the biggest problem areas while traveling? Is there anything we can do to prepare before we leave? And keeping in mind, it's not just about keeping yourself safe, but there's a chance you might have something and you want to avoid spreading viruses to other people, right? Exactly. And a couple things, you know, one, look at your community and look at the rates in your community and not just for COVID, but for flu and RSV. And we know it, there are hot spots around the country. If you're coming from a hot spot, then definitely think about testing. Think about masking at the airports, because that still is an area where, especially now with Thanksgiving travel, you're going to have a lot of people in very close contact. You know, think about on the airlines and stuff on the airplane, although we know that is safer than the airport about masking as well. And these are steps to take just to protect those that you love when you get to that situation where you're at your Thanksgiving dinner. Again, especially if there's more vulnerable people. But when you're at the dinner, you know, hand washing is going to be important. Opening windows, like Gabe had mentioned, important to get that circulation if you can, because it could be in some cold areas where you can't do that. But the main point is, you know, well, number one, enjoy Thanksgiving. This is a good holiday to enjoy, and we haven't been able to the last couple of years. But at the same time, stay safe. Is that the riskiest thing you think that actually when you get to your final destination, you're sitting in a room with family, you're eating together? I mean, is that the biggest thing where you really just need to be conscious of what's going on? You know, I think the riskiest thing is the getting there part of it because the airport is going to be the riskiest part. You're in an area with lots of people. There's going to be thousands of people shoulder to shoulder. It's a very busy travel day. Masking there would be important. But then when you get to the area where you're with your loved ones, you know, talk about different, you know, the, the different things you need to do to stay safe. And you have a graphic here showing avoid sharing cups and utensils when eating. That's still good advice because we know some of these, especially RSV, can spread through contact. You know, it's very easy. The other ones can spread as well, but not quite as easily. So you want to be careful. A lot of hand washing. And then uh, we love when babies come and show up for these holidays. And we love holding the baby, kissing the baby, and <laughs> passing it around to different relatives. Let's not do that this holiday because, again, we want to keep them safe. And we know RSV is a big thing right now. Exactly. That might be the toughest advice you're giving, but it's very important. Dr. John Torres, thank you so much. Exactly. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family.
Coming up, we are following the latest in Virginia and that deadly mass shooting at a Walmart right before Thanksgiving. We're going to have the latest on the investigation there coming up. Plus, developing overseas, at least one person is dead and more than a dozen are hurt after two bombs went off in Jerusalem. We are at the scene with more on what we know about these blasts coming up in just a few minutes. We are staying on top of breaking news out of Chesapeake, Virginia. That's where at least six people were killed after a mass shooting at a Walmart. A senior law enforcement official tells NBC News the shooter was an employee there, a disgruntled employee. Police would only confirm that he was an employee and that he died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. So far, his name has not been released, but investigators say they've executed a search warrant at his home. The Chesapeake police chief says officers were on the scene just minutes after the initial 911 call. Our 911 dispatch center received the first call at 10:12 p.m. last night. The first officers arrived on scene within two minutes at 10:14, and entered the store approximately two minutes later at 10:16. The first responding officers entered the store, and the scene was declared safe by 11:20 p.m. So to recap, six people killed. The gunman also confirmed dead. Four victims are currently being treated at area hospitals, but their conditions have not been released. Right now, investigators say there is no clear motive for the attack, that they'll spend several days processing the scene while their investigation is ongoing. Breaking news out of Jerusalem this morning, at least one person is dead and 14 are injured after two bombs detonated at two different bus stops this morning. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Jerusalem. So Raf, first of all, just what's the latest there? Joe, we're at the site of the first of two bus stop bombings which rocked Jerusalem this morning. The bomb here went off at about 7 a.m. at the beginning of rush hour when this stop, which is on the main road from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, was full of commuters on their way to work as well as students on their way to school. One person was killed here. He's a 16-year-old Canadian-Israeli boy, a student at a religious school here in Jerusalem. A number of other people were injured, including an American teenager. She thankfully suffered only minor injuries, but there are several people in serious conditions in hospital here in Jerusalem. Now, police are saying these appear to have been fairly sophisticated bombings, both the blast that took place here and the other one at a second bus stop about a mile north of here. They seem to have been detonated by cell phone. And Joe, this is the first bombing here in Jerusalem in at least six years. The specter of terrorism returning to the streets of this city. A major manhunt is now underway by Israeli security forces who say they are determined to find the people responsible for this. Joe. Raf, thank you. We're now taking a closer look at the impact that corporate investors have on the housing crisis. NBC News first began investigating how the practice of corporate investors buying up and renting single family homes was pricing out first time buyers. But now we've learned that renters are being impacted, too. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez reports. Janika Allen is a single mom who cares for Alzheimer's patients at a nursing home. Recently, she had reason to worry she'd be out of her home and out on the street. Your rent went up. Rent went up. And you had no idea. Had no idea. How'd you find out? I got eviction notice. Allen says her landlord, Vinebrook Homes, raised her rent and charged a new fee without her knowledge. She then struggled to communicate with the company through an automated online portal. Then came the order to get out. How stunning was it to see that eviction notice? It was very, very stunning. It actually just crushed because I'm like, wait a minute, what is going on? Vinebrook owns more than 24,000 single family homes in mostly lower income areas across 18 states. It's among the largest corporate landlords in the U.S. and owns more than 6,000 homes in southwest Ohio alone. Here in the Cincinnati area, real estate is particularly attractive to corporate investors because of low prices and laws that favor landlords. Feinberg is one of the growing number of institutional investors buying up single-family homes that they then turn into rentals. How many homes does Vinebrook own in this neighborhood? 220. 220? Yes. Just in this one neighborhood? Yes. Laura Brunner runs the Port of Greater Cincinnati Development Authority and says Vinebrook has raised rents, been quick to evict, and slow to repair homes. It's actually brilliant. You know, they found a really, really good way to make a lot of money. Is it right? I don't think it's right. I think it's predatory. 
In July of 2021, the city of Cincinnati sued Vinebrook to recover more than $600,000 in unpaid water bills and fines. Vinebrook would not comment on the record about the suit, but settled it a month later, paying almost all what the city said was owed. How crushing is this for lower income residents? It's huge. Jordan Kotler is a staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society of Greater Cincinnati, which has about 25 open cases against Vinebrook. The model of automating the property management system doesn't work. Vinebrook declined to answer specific questions about renter disputes, but the company provided a written statement about its mission to provide safe, functional, and clean rental homes that are affordable to a range of budgets. Vinebrook pointed out that four out of five of its residents renew their leases each year. I feel like an elephant is on top of my chest. This June, Janika Allen reached a settlement with Vinebrook to rescind both the rent increase and the eviction notice. But the next month, even though she was sending in her rent, she was threatened with eviction again. I believe this company has got away with a lot because people don't want to share their story. After NBC News contacted Vinebrook, her case was quickly resolved. But at this Cincinnati courthouse, 20 other tenants are still fighting against their corporate landlord. Gabe Gutierrez, NBC News, Cincinnati. Coming up, most of us are used to watching a different kind of football during Thanksgiving, but this year the World Cup is adding football to the list. We're talking about soccer, how the tournament is creating more interest in soccer here in the U.S. Coming up. World Cup fever is sweeping the globe, including here in the U.S., where most Americans are used to watching a different kind of football on Thanksgiving. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has been soaking up the atmosphere with soccer fans at watch parties in Florida and joins us with more. Hey, Sam, good morning. Joe, good morning. Germany and Japan are playing right now. The German soccer fans here nearly broke the sound barrier a second ago when Germany scored. So just bear with me if we start hearing a lot of loud noise behind me. But well, here we go. There is a lot of enthusiasm today. The Americans, Joe, are playing on Friday against England. One of these tables here is going for $500 as everyone is vying for one of these bad boys. Just to give you a sense of the setting, I have Bavarian pretzels and beer steins at you know, 7, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. The reality is a lot of people right now are giving up the tradition and being swept up in a new November activity. When you talk about holiday football, the Lions, the Cowboys, and the Pigskin are probably your first thoughts. But this year, it's actually football that's got fans in the streets in Washington, D.C.'s DuPont Circle. And partying in Lancaster, PA, not far from where star midfielder Christian Pulisic grew up in Hershey. Great to see a local guy out there. Soccer's infectious international appeal. We were ready eight years ago, and we're just really excited to actually be back to do this. Finding a suddenly captivated audience in November for the event held in Qatar, a location too hot to play in summer. The time of year, no problem for founders of the American Outlaws, a group of 20,000 members deep, organizing many of the watch parties erupting throughout the states. I would recommend anyone to like take that opportunity to watch with other people because you experience those moments with outside of just yourself and your house. That is like what you remember forever. For the U.S. and its upstart squad, the second youngest of the 32 teams with an average age of 25 years, 214 days old, it's diversity drawing in new viewers at home. With nearly 12 million people watching the U.S.-Wales match across Fox and Telemundo in the middle of the day on Monday. I think it's going to be a very unique experience. It's going to bring a lot of different eyes to the sport. At the Sports Grill in South Miami, a perfect snapshot of excitement for the sport. With a group of Americans watching with students from Australia, France, Italy, Japan, and Spain. We try to, but you know, we have these rivalries between countries, so, but we try to. We're friends. The stakes are high, even as right across the bar, priorities are placed on a different set of Thursday football games. I didn't even realize the World Cup was on because I was so, I'm so focused on the NFL football. On Thanksgiving Day, there's going to be three NFL games on? and four World Cup matches. Which one are you going to be watching? Oh, surely the World Cup. World Cup. Yeah, World Cup. Cup. all the way. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, guys. <laughs> We're definitely watching the World Cup. Joe, we talked a lot about the diversity and the youth of this American squad. There are 12 black players. That is quadruple 
the previous high of three in 2014. And as for the youth, the best player on Team USA, Christian Pulisic, he was born in September of 1998. At that time, the movie that was coming out on the day he was born was Rush Hour with Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker. Joe, I remember going to see that movie as a teenager if you wanted to feel old. Now, I most certainly do. Back that to you, de friend. Definitely did it. But I'm going to think about the beer and pretzels I'm going to have for breakfast now because of this, and that's going to cheer me up. All right. Sam, thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving, my friend. Now, shoppers are soon going to be hitting the stores for the top steals and deals on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. But since inflation has had retail Retailers cutting prices over the last few months. Will people be able to get the best bang for their buck? NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has more on that. With America's banner day of holiday deals on deck and promises of staggering savings on display, shoppers are already looking beyond the Thanksgiving feast to Black Friday. It looks like there's going to be some good sales, and we're excited about that. And in some cases, beyond. I usually find the sales just keep going on through the rest of the season. Indeed, amid sky-high inflation, discounts have been mounting for months. So, with the infamous Christmas creep not just applying to early decorations, but deals, too, it begs a question. Are Black Friday, and even Cyber Monday for that matter, as big of a deal this year? Well, they still are a really big deal. In fact, the National Retail Federation estimating more than 166 million Americans plan to shop between Thanksgiving and Cyber Monday, the group's highest estimate ever, up nearly 8 million from last year. Given inflation's fluctuating effect on prices, experts recommend shoppers do their research. It's harder to know if you are getting a good deal, but the deals are still out there. For electronics, the lowest prices are on Black Friday. With clothing, especially winter clothing, those prices will drop in January. So you really ideally want to wait if you can. And if you have your eye on something specific, like this year's hottest toy, consider buying early in case stores run out. Setting up Santa for a successful holiday, too. Maggie Vespa, NBC News, Chicago. Coming up, a Thanksgiving tradition that a lot of us have been following for years. This is a good one. A grandmother accidentally texts the wrong number, inviting a stranger to Thanksgiving dinner. Well, that mishap has turned into a lifelong friendship. We're going to check, on a, check in on them and their Thanksgiving plans. That's next. For football fans, Thanksgiving weekend means a big weekend of college football rivalry games. But despite the pressure on the field, one star running back still found the time to give back to his community. NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas has the story. Star Michigan running back Blake Corum knows a thing or two about carrying a team. On third down and goal, Corum, touchdown Michigan! This three-yard finish, just the latest of his 18 rushing touchdowns this season. He's on many short lists to win the Heisman. As a player, Blake is explosive. Yeah, he's a beast. He's a beast. Blake is a beast out there. Right now, Michigan is ranked number three, and the team will rely on Corum this weekend when they face off against number two, Ohio State. The Big Ten Championship and the college football playoffs, both at stake. I mean, we know Ohio State's our toughest, toughest competition. Uh, this will be our toughest test to date. But even with the pressure of the Heisman and the biggest game of the season this weekend, Corum is thinking about more than just football. He wants to score big for hungry families. He's amazing in, in all ways. He's larger than life um, personality, uh, larger than life empathy. Corum using the money from his name, image, and likeness, known as NIL deals, to give back to communities near campus. You know, I donated uh, some turkeys, but I mean, my role is really just to be here. You know, with, with the rest of the community, everyone's, you know, put in the effort to make this possible. So, uh, you know, shout out to everyone that's here, man. This is, uh, this is great, as you can see. Uh, it is amazing. This is the second year in a row Corum has donated hundreds of Thanksgiving turkeys to those in need. I think how he approaches um, stuff like this and giving back. He is a beast in that manner. A star football player using his platform not only to fire up crowds, but also help improve the lives of those outside the stadium. It's a crazy world we live in, and I feel like, you know, it, it takes a it takes an army to change things, right? And so, you know, we can all together stick together, you know, bring the community together and just help change the world in the slightest way. And that was Tom Yamas reporting. The winner of Saturday's big game between Michigan and Ohio State will become one of the favorites to win this year's college football playoff. That kicks off 
right after Christmas. Finally this hour, a Thanksgiving mix-up turned heartwarming tradition that is still going strong seven years later. And it all started when a grandmother mistakenly texted a stranger an invite to Thanksgiving dinner. NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren caught up with this. This is one of our favorite stories. Right, I love telling this story. And I was actually with them, Joe, on that first Thanksgiving. <laughs> I've got to say, I wasn't sure when they said they would still be friends that they would be, but that friendship has only grown over the years. And you will not believe some of the things they've been up to. Oh my gosh, it's so nice to see you guys. Did you ever think you would still be talking about this seven years on? No, not at all. Right up front, Jamal. When I first met Wanda Dench and Jamal Hinton in 2016, they were strangers, brought together by a mistaken text. The grandma writing, Thanksgiving dinner at my house at three. Jamal answering, you're not my grandma. Can I still get a plate though? The rest is viral legend. Oh, I'm like her. But what started as a mix-up and ensuing media frenzy has become a tale of something much greater. He's literally changed my life and my point of view uh, on young generations uh, about being open to friendships when you think you have nothing in common with somebody. But when you just sit and talk to them, oh my gosh. They talk throughout the year, meet for dinners, when Jamal started a business, he put Wanda on the billboard. I've always told her whatever I'm doing, she's a part of no matter what it is. They celebrate all sorts of milestones. I accompanied Wanda for her first tattoo uh, about a month ago. A tattoo? Oh yeah, that's right. And that's like BFF level when you're getting getting tattoos, right? <laughs> I guess so. Matching yeah. tattoos next. <laughs> they clearly have fun. But there have also been hard times. When Wanda's husband, Lonnie, died of COVID, Jamal and his girlfriend, Michaela, were there for her. I heard some rustling at my front door, and I opened it up. And Jamal and Michaela were dropping off a whole bunch of food and, and gifts and stuff. Hey, guys. How are you? The kind of friendship Americans can't get enough of. And what is this I hear about a movie? Yes. Oh, we're not allowed to talk about it. Their next adventure? A Netflix film in development. Of course, as life goes on, there are changes. Wanda is retiring and moving a few hours away. So you'll be driving next Thanksgiving? Yes, it's gonna be Do a blast. Do <laughs> have plans for next year. <laughs> Other things haven't changed. He is big on texting me, but uh, I'm always like, just call me. We're gonna work on your text. Don't worry, we're gonna work on your text. <laughs> Sometimes texting mistakes lead to exactly what you need. I honestly don't know where like I would be sometimes, so it's it's amazing to have her as a friend and as as my family. <laughs> a friendship for the ages, something they're thankful for every day of the year. We always talk about that, and I told her like, hey, like the cameras at a fame, everything could stop tomorrow, and nothing's changing between us. So. Absolutely. Yeah, he's, he's in my heart for, for life. I know, yeah. I love it. Yeah, so it's such a genuine friendship. And I have to tell you, they're such nice people. When I was sick a few years ago, Wanda texted me oh. to let me know that they were thinking of me. They're making a pie together today, and we actually have the recipe online, Ooh. I think, at today.com, if Check anyone is interested what in... What kind of pie? Uh, a pumpkin pie, of All course. Right. Of course, all right. <laughs> Maybe you can get a tattoo with them next, then. You're part of the Ooh, club. No. I know, I asked who was going to play me in the movie, because <laughs> I was there. <laughs> And, and we don't know. Jamal said he's not even allowed to play himself. All right. So. Okay. It's a secret. <laughs> well, stay tuned. Kristen, yeah. thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you too. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.